Welcome to the second segment of uh, Isaiah is for you today. Uh, earlier in the first uh, introduction session, we talked about the four or five topics that we were going to discuss during this class. The first one is Yahweh re-revealed. And the second one would be the hidden mystery, hidden no more. The third, Jesus the Messiah foretold. Then the extraordinary eschatological information that's in Isaiah. And then sin, the consequences, and judgment. Well, today we're going to focus on the first of those topics, God re-revealed to Israel. As I said earlier in the first segment, it's truly a shame that God would have to retell Israel all about himself. But it is also a great blessing for us because we can now read the book of Isaiah and learn so much about our God because there are many, many different um, appellations which are, are um, descriptions of his titles and his, uh, what his responsibilities are. We can learn this and get a greater, greater scope of our God, which I, I truly, truly appreciate and I'm very thankful for. One of the tragedies of Christianity today is, is that uh, so often there is a dearth of understanding of the Old Testament. Really, when, when somebody witnesses to another Christian, they, they encourage them to go to the Gospels to learn all about Jesus, which is you know, certainly a vital information, very important as a Christian. So we go to Matthew or we go to the book of John and we start studying there. The problem with this is, is that in the New Testament, most of the information contained therein is to explain to people who Jesus is and who our Lord is. And it talks about him much more so than it talks about God. However, in the Old Testament is when God reveals himself. So it, 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 particularly in the Torah, in the first five books, and then in the, in the, in the uh, revelation of the book of Isaiah, there's really tremendous information that explains who God is. Well, if you don't have this underpinning of the Old Testament, when you come to the New Testament, it's easy to understand why people confuse who Jesus is and who Yahweh, our God, is, because they don't have that understanding. So for us to focus on this today and to look at the greatness of who God is in the book of Isaiah is truly a great blessing and, and essential for our understanding of both the New and the Old Testament. The very first thing that I want to bring to your attention is that um, the word God, like I said earlier in the first segment, he, he, that is used 142 times in this book and uh, where he makes known to Israel because they had lost the identity of God. They had lost the understanding that that Yahweh is God. They were worshiping false gods, gods they had made with their own hands, made out of, out of wood, and they were worshiping them. So God explains who he is. Yahweh explains that he is God. And then he compares himself to their false idols and how foolish and impotent these idols are that they are worshiping in the stead of the one true God. In Isaiah chapter uh, 30, it says, Woe to the rebellious children, declares Yahweh, who execute a plan, but not mine, and make an alliance, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin. What was happening here in this chapter, what is being addressed is that Israel as a nation, or Judah as a nation, is under the threat of the Assyrians taking over the whole of the known world at that time. They were invading the land and they were conquering city after city and country after country. And what Israel was doing was that they were going to, to, to Egypt and hiring them almost as mercenaries to, to fight their battles against the Assyrians. And God is appalled at this. How can you go back to the people and once you were enslaved to and now expect them to be your liberators? when they should have been going to Yahweh, their God. Problem is, they didn't believe in God. They didn't understand who he was. So he's, he's reproving them for that. In verse 2 it says, Who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me, to take refuge the safety of Pharaoh, and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore the safety of Pharaoh will be your shame. 
and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt, your humiliation. In verse 9, it says, For this is a rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of Yahweh, who says to the seer, You must not see visions, and to the prophets, You must not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusions. Verse 11 says, Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, Since you have rejected this word and have put your trust in oppression and guile and have relied on them, Therefore, thus iniquity will be to you, like a breach about to fall, like a bulge in a high wall, whose collapse comes suddenly in an instant, whose collapse is like the smashing of a potter's jar, so ruthlessly shattered that a shred will not be found among its pieces to take fire from the hearth or to scoop water from a cistern. In their culture, if they broke a pot, they, they, you know, they, a pot was a valuable thing. They wouldn't just throw the pieces away. They would take some of the pieces, or the, or the broken pieces, and they would scoop the coals out of a fire and use it to transfer it to another place for a fire. Or they would use it to move water from one place to another. He said, what's going to happen to you is that you're going to be shattered in splintered pieces so that neither... You could use it for the coals or for the water. You'll be totally annihilated because your trust and your confidence is in a government, a people, a foreign people, rather than the one true God. So he is addressing this negativity, this terrible way of thinking that was theirs. 15. The Lord God, the Holy One of Israel has said, In repentance and rest, look at this verse, In repentance and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. What a wonderful truth. Not only for them then, but for us now. In repentance and rest, you will be saved. Not in your own ability, not in your own might or strength, not in the strength of the government or some other foreign entity, not in anything in this world, but in Yahweh, our God. So in repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. But, to Israel he says, you were not willing. Verse 18, look at this great truth. Therefore, Yahweh longs to be gracious to you. He longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he waits on high to have compassion on you. For Yahweh is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. But the people of Israel at that time did not long for him. He, he's waiting on high to have compassion on them. He is waiting on high to bless them, to care for them, to guide them, to lead them. But they rejected him as the true God. So he's identifying himself to them so that they may better know who he is. Chapter 40 of Isaiah. This is again, it's throughout the book you see this where God explains to them He is God, the only God. In Isaiah 40, verse 18, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with Him? As for the idol, a craftsman cast it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, and a silversmith fashions a chain of silver. He who is too impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a skilled craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the world? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretched out the heavens as a curtain or like a curtain and spread them like a tent to dwell in. Yahweh, like a curtain, 
He spread out the heavens, the, the trillions of stars that are in the universe, he, like, a, like a bathroom curtain or the curtain on a window. He just spread them out and they're in existence. Instead of worshiping this God, they're worshiping a God they made out of wood that seemingly would not rot. Half in another place it says, half of the, of the wood you cut, you put it in the fire, you burn yourself, you warm yourself by it, you cook food by it. Then you dress it up and you kneel down and you bow and you worship it. How foolish and insane and insidious is their behavior when the one true God was willing to lovingly help them and be there for them and be their sufficiency. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain, again in verse 22, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes judges of the earth meaningless, Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them, and they wither, and the storm carries them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me, that I will be his equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created the stars, the one who leads forth the hosts by number, who calls them by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, no one of them is missing. God placed every one of them. He created every star that is in not only our galaxy, but all of the, the thousands or millions or trillions of galaxies that are in existence. And he has a name for every one of those stars. This is our God. And you want to worship a piece of wood? You want to, you want to go to Egypt and look for their strength to be your salvation? You want to look to some man or some government or some institution, some piece of wood other than the one true God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth? Again, how foolish that is. We ourselves, our trust, our confidence should always be upon our God. Our God is the mighty God. Our God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Our God is our Father. And he has loving, caring, concern. He waits on high to have compassion on you because he's a God of justice. He won't violate your free will. How blessed are those who long for him. We should long for him. So that's the name God, how it's used in the book of Isaiah. Another point that I have to obviously bring to your attention is Yahweh. For the name Yahweh, his, this is God's proper name, his name, Yahweh, is used 451 times in the book of Isaiah. 451 times. He wanted Israel to know that God is Yahweh and Yahweh is God. In like manner, he wants us to know that. This wonderful name, Yahweh, when it was first explained to Moses, it was the understanding that was given when he said, I am I, I, that Yahweh is the I am. It, the, the essence of what he, was, he teaches us and shows us and explains to us about Yahweh's name is that he is the existing one. He is the eternal one. He is the present one. He has always been. He was, he is, he will always be. He is always with us everywhere we go all of the time. This is the name of Yahweh. When you hear that name, this is what you should think. He is with me. He is the eternal one. He is the existing one. He is the present one. A name is, 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 is how someone is distinctly known from someone else. Many names in the Bible held great significance relating to God. Abram's name was changed to Abraham. Sarai's name was changed to Sarah. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. The, all of these name changes had significance to them that reflected their relationship with Yahweh. Today, some parents invent names for their children rather than uh, use the names and the examples of the names and, that are in the scriptures or why to name a child a certain way that would bring glory to God. It reminds me of this psychiatrist, this noted psychiatrist, in, in working with different mothers, he, he acknowledged, he came to the understanding that they would name their children based upon their obsessions. Like the, the woman who had a sweet tooth, you know, she named her daughter Candy. And uh, like the, uh, 
the woman who uh, was um, <laughs> the woman who was all about uh, money called her daughter Penny, and uh, the woman who was an alcoholic called her cell, her daughter Brandy, and the the man who was an accountant called his son Bill, and the horticulturist called her triplets, um, Lily, Rose, and what's another name, or Daisy. Well, uh, the name of God, however, is really not a much of a laughing issue. Uh, quite contrary, God is very serious about people knowing His name. His name is repeated almost 7,000 times in the Scriptures. He wants us to know His name. It says His name is to be exalted. His name is to be worshipped. His name is to be magnified. His name is to be glorified. His name is to be told to every generation. He wants all the world to know that God is Yahweh. And Yahweh is God. In, in Isaiah chapter 12, in verse 4, And in that day you will say, Give thanks to Yahweh, call on His name, make known His deeds among the peoples, make them remember that His name is exalted. His name is exalted. In Isaiah 42, 8, again it says, I am Yahweh. That is is my name. He wants us to know his name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven Im images. Throughout the book of Isaiah, this is a big topic of, of conversation. This is a big controversy that Yahweh has with the children of Israel. They're worshiping idols, false images, rather than Yahweh, the one true God. In chapter 48 and verse 2, it says, For they call themselves after the holy city and lean on the God of Israel. Yahweh of hosts is his name. In chapter 50 and verse 10, it says, Who is among you that fears Yahweh, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of Yahweh and rely on his God. In chapter 51, in verse 15, it says, For I am Yahweh your God, who stirs up the sea, and its waves roar. Yahweh of hosts is his name. Chapter 54, in verse 5, For your husband is your maker, talking about God, whose name is Yahweh of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. Yahweh is his name. Another thing that, another phrase that is used explaining who our God is frequently in the book of Isaiah is Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts or Yahweh of hosts is most frequently as it's, as it's understood. Yahweh of hosts. It's a favorite phrase among all of the prophets because it, it ind its indication is of God's power in human affairs and also in all of the universe and all of His creation. He is the God who has numberless hosts in heaven. He is the God of the armies of heaven and the armies of earth. That All of this is included in the understanding of what it means, Yahweh of hosts. Um, above every, he's he is over all, he has an army in heaven, and he can control the armies that are here on earth. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we see that the prophet's servant is all nervous because the enemy is surrounding them, and he's fearful because they're going to be taken captive and killed. And then the prophet shows him, he, 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 he prays that God lifts up his, uh, his understanding and helps him to see spiritually what's going on. And they're surrounded with a host of angels that are protecting them. The angels are the part of the armies of heaven. The Lord of hosts is over all of them. Again, this terminology or this phrase is used very often in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 8, for example, in verse 13, It is Yahweh of hosts whom you shall regard as holy. He shall be your fear. He shall be your dread. 
We need not dread anybody in this world or anything in this world. We need not fear any sickness or disease or pestilence. We need not fear any enemy. If we're going to have any, any fear at all, it would be of Yahweh, of hosts. He is the one that is all powerful over all the armies of heaven and earth. In chapter 9, in verse 7, it says, There will be no end to the increase of his government or peace. Talking about the Messiah when he comes. On the throne of David, over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of Yahweh of hosts will accomplish this. In chapter 9, in verse 19, But the fury of Yahweh of hosts, the land is burned up. The people are like fuel for fire. No man spares his brother. Perhaps the reason Yahweh of hosts is used so frequently in the book of Isaiah and in many of the other prophets is because it's, there's so much about his judgment and, and the consequences of the sins of the people and his judgment upon the people. That in the end, he is the God of justice. You know, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Loving kindness and truth go before him, but his arm is a strong arm. It's an exalted arm. His right arm is exalted. And, and he will, in the end, make sure justice and righteousness prevails and that everything is equitable. He is the one that is going to judge every man, woman, and child. He has been and he will be and it will be an eternal judgment. He is the Lord of hosts. He's not to be trifled with. He is the God, uh, he is the God of the armies of heaven and earth. He is in charge of all of the universe. In chapter 13, in verse 4, we see a sound of turmoil on the mountains, like the many people, a sound of uproar of the kingdoms of the nations gathered together. Yahweh of hosts is mustering the army to battle. Now, I want you to take a close look at this verse again, the latter part of it. Yahweh of hosts, you see that word there, is mustering up the army. The word army is the same Hebrew word that is translated hosts in the same verse. Hosts and army are the same Hebrew word. So you get an understanding of what this word hosts means. It's, it doesn't always mean uh, the, the God of the armies of heaven and earth, because sometimes it talks about the hosts of heaven, or talking about the stars, talking about the host of the stars, where it's an innumerable amount. You can't count it, there's so many. 13, 13. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken from its place. For the fury of Yahweh of hosts in the day of his burning anger. We see again, it's in the, in, in the judgment that Yahweh and the wrath of Yahweh that's going to come on those who reject him. The next name or appellation of, of Yahweh that I want to bring to your attention in the book of Isaiah is the mighty one of Israel. He is referred to as the mighty one. And in, in chapter 1 and verse 23, we'll go there and we'll look and we'll see what it says about the mighty one of Israel. Therefore, the Lord Yahweh of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares, Ha! I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself of my foes. The mighty one of Israel will destroy the enemies and exalt the repentant ones. Two sides. He will destroy the enemies and he will exalt the repentant ones. In chapter 49, in verse 26, it says, I will feed your oppressors with their own flesh and they will become drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh will know that I, Yahweh, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Isn't that wonderful? Yahweh, your Savior, your Redeemer, your Mighty One of Israel, or of Jacob. In chapter 60, it says, in verse 16, You will also suck the milk of the nations and suck the breasts of kings, then you will know Yahweh, your Savior, and your Redeemer, 
the mighty one of Jacob. The mighty one of Israel, the mighty one of Jacob. God, Yahweh, is the mighty one. To close this out, I want to look at Yahweh, the holy one. To appreciate this, you have to understand the setting of where Israel was at this time. They were anything but holy. Actually, it's very applicable for us to remember in our time. He is the Holy One of Israel. He has given to us a Holy Spirit. Every Christian, every believer is given the Holy Spirit. And the reason that is, is not just for power. It's not just for a connection with Yahweh. It's not just for a connection with Jesus, all of which are vital and, and wonderful for us. But it's so that we too can be holy. We have been called to be holy and blameless before Him in love. He, he is holy and He wants us to be holy. He is the Holy One of Israel. And this really stands out in the book of Isaiah because of the things that are said about their state at that time. In, in chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned Yahweh. They have despised the Holy One of Israel, and they turned away from Him. So you have a, a sinful people filled with iniquity that act corruptly. They are just the complete antithesis of the God that they should be worshiping, the Holy One of Israel. In chapter 4, it says in verse 3, It will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. When Yahweh has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. The problem with Israel at that time is they were a filthy people because they were a sinful people. They were filled with iniquity and transgression. No, therefore, they had no entree to the Holy God, the Holy One of Israel. In chapter 6, when Isaiah is first commissioned, he says in, in verse 5, then he said, Woe is me! Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and have lived among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory. He understood that he was unclean, and that he lived among a people who were unclean. And then the, the seraphim took the coal from off of the altar, and put it on his lips, and cleansed him, and cleaned him. The only way that anyone can be cleansed or cleaned in any way cleansed in any way is by God's grace and mercy and, and today through the, the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In chapter 64 verse 6 it says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind. Take us away. In chapter 40, in verse 25 and 26, it says, To whom then will you liken me, that I would be his equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their hosts by number. He calls them by name because of the greatness of his might and strength and of his power. Not one of them is missing. Again, in Isaiah 43, verse 15, I am Yahweh, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Well, how does this Isaiah record about our God relate to us today? How is Isaiah for you today in light of the different appellations of God, the different names and titles of God? When we come to our God and when we worship Him, when we speak to Him, we understand that He alone is God. The great Shema, hear, O Israel, Yahweh is God. 
Yahweh is one. When we pray to Him, when we worship Him, when we magnify Him, we understand that Yahweh is our God. We understand that He is the Lord of hosts. He is the Mighty One of Israel. He is the Holy One. And there is so much more that we will look at in the sessions that follow.